Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Tim Bako. I work for the Ethereum Foundation. And today I'm going to give you an overview of the Ethereum roadmap. Um, this will be kind of a quick run through uh, in 10 to 15 minutes. Um, and we'll have a longer panel uh, scheduled right after to discuss some other interesting questions in Ethereum. So um, first, I'll just go very quickly over some recent Ethereum upgrades we've had. Um, in the past year, there's been a lot that's come to the network. Um, and the biggest thing I think, you know, everyone listening here is probably aware of is the launch of the Beacon Chain uh, at the end of 2020. Uh, so this was a huge milestone that had been worked on for years. Um, and in October, we finally launched the Beacon Chain deposit contract on mainnet, which needed to hit a minimum amount of Ether deposited in it before it went live. Uh, about a month later, on November 24th, we hit that amount. And today, we have over $22 billion and 215000 dollars 215,000 validators running on the Beacon Chain. Um, so it's really been kind of a, a huge success in, in getting this uh, very technical uh, upgrade up and running and you know being secure with, with a, a, a very large amount of funds uh, at stake. In parallel to that, or sorry, slightly after that, uh, we had a big upgrade on the Ethereum mainnet called Berlin. There, the biggest change that happened was we uh, raised a lot of gas costs, which had which were previously uh, vulnerable to denial of service risks on the Ethereum network. And we also introduced EIP 2718, which is a transaction envelope. So kind of a wrapper that we can put around transactions, which allows us to introduce many new transaction types to Ethereum. And this was a really useful building block uh, for the upgrade that would come after London, uh, given that EIP-1559 would require a new type of transaction. So, um, oh, this slide is a bit wrong. So it says Q2, Q3, but uh, we actually, you know, just had London go live uh, on August 5th. Uh, like I just mentioned, August, uh, London brought EIP-1559, which was a huge change to how the fee market works on Ethereum. Um, we'd been working on it for over two years, and it was a big improvement to basically the UX of Ethereum and the economics of the network. Uh, so we were able to deploy this because uh, Berlin had kind of laid the groundwork for it. And we also had a couple of interesting changes come along with it. Uh, one was EIP 3529, apologies, which uh, changed how gas refunds work on the network so that they were not exploitable anymore uh, by things like gas tokens. Um, and finally, we delayed the difficulty bomb uh, during the London upgrade to December, which uh, will probably have to delay once more, but uh, getting very close to the merge, it was one of the final times we'd had to do that. And we also uh, had EIP 3541, which uh, laid the groundwork for being able to have different types of contracts in the EVM. Right now, all of the contracts follow the same rules. And with EIP 3541, we're able to basically uh, reserve some bytes for contracts and that um, when uh, we have another upgrade, we can, we can use those bytes to identify different uh, instructions that the EVM should follow for those contracts. In parallel uh, to this, the uh, the team working on the consensus layer, so on the beacon chain, is, is working on their first network upgrade called Altair. Uh, this will be the first time that there's actually an upgrade to the beacon chain. And while it's not bringing a ton of new functionality, it, it's really important because it will test the basically network upgrade function uh, of the beacon chain. And it does bring a lot of, of, of neat things like the ability to have light client support uh, on the beacon chain, which we don't have today. And probably most importantly, uh, increasing the penalties uh, for things like uh, being slashed or being inactive. So when the beacon chain launch, we intentionally lowered the amount uh, by which we would penalize people because it was still ex very experimental. But now that it's been live for a while, um, it made sense to just raise those penalties to the amount that they, they should be. And now, as you've probably heard uh, by now, uh, the focus is all on the merge. So the merge is basically moving Ethereum from proof of work to proof of stake. And it's worth kind of going over um, how this roadmap came to be uh, and, and why we can do the merge now. So a few years ago, I'm sure everyone here remembers, there was this uh, 
Ethereum 2.0 roadmap with phase zero, phase one, and phase two. So phase zero was going to bring proof of stake. Then sharding was going to come in phase one, which would be just shards that store any data on them. And then in phase two, we would convert these data shards to EVM shards or execution environments so that we could scale computation. Um, as we were working on this roadmap, uh, like I mentioned, we got proof of stake re released, um, but in parallel to that, the community started uh, working on layer two scaling solutions, specifically rollups. And we saw really, really good progress on that where uh, rollups kind of started to be a more proven way that we could scale computation where we had some initial data around them actually working and being ready to go live. Whereas uh, all the R&D around phase two was still very early. Um, and so the roadmap kind of shifted a bit where instead of basically having shards and then converting those shards to computation, uh, we thought, well, why don't we just have the shards store data like in phase one and then scale computation using rollups? And rollups actually produce a lot of data. So it would be really valuable for them to have the shards um, to store that data, but they'll still work without them. And so they go from being kind of a must have to scaling to a nice to have after scaling. Um, and if we did that, we could also just keep a single EVM shard, which is the current Ethereum network, um, running all the computations. And then uh, a, a, a month or so after that, there was kind of a final refinement of this idea saying, well, if we're going to have a single shard with the EVM, why don't we just couple that directly with the beacon chain and not make it a shard, but make the beacon chain the consensus engine for the Ethereum network? And if you're familiar with, say, Ethereum testnets or private networks, you know that Ethereum clients can already support multiple consensus algorithms, right? Like on the Gordy network, uh, for example, they run Clique. Uh, so do, they do the same thing on the, on the Rinkeby network. And several private networks using Ethereum have different consensus algorithms. So it's already kind of a, a function of Ethereum clients to... Uh, to uh, be able to switch to a different consensus algorithm. So the idea with the design of the merge now is instead of you know, making turning the EVM into something else, we can simply have the current Ethereum clients like Geth, uh, Open Ethereum, Basu, and Nethermine change their consensus algorithm to follow the proof of stake system that's being maintained by the current E2 clients rather than to follow proof of work. And that's really kind of the core of the idea today. To be sure that this would actually work, uh, we decided to uh, prototype it during a long hackathon. So back in May, we had a month-long hackathon where we basically ran all of these uh, Ethereum One clients as kind of execution layer engines for the for the post-merge system, and those used the E2 clients so as a consensus layer. So we used uh, basically Prism, Lighthouse, Teku, and, and Nimbus as a, as a consensus layer, and Get, Basu, and Nethermind as an execution layer running transactions. So after about a month of hacking, we got to a final test net, which was called Nocturne, which was able to actually process uh, blocks in a post-merge network. Um, and here I have a kind of a screen capture of it where uh, if you're familiar with the Ethereum 2.0 Explorers, you might have seen something that looks like this before. So the first couple rows that we have here are things that are common for uh, a Beacon Chain Explorer. So you have the graffiti that tells you, you know, this is Lighthouse. Then you have the ETH1 data that tells you basically the, which block they're looking at on ETH1. Um, and then you have something that's called the execution payload. And what this does is it shows that there was a block that was sent from this Lighthouse node to an execution node, whether that's get, Basu, or whatever. Um, and it actually processed the block and ran the transaction and reported back that this was a valid block to the consensus engine. Um, so this is really how things will work in a post-merge world where the beacon chain is the one kind of setting the head of the network, coming to consensus on it, and then it sends the data to the execution client, which will then process the blocks, add transactions to it, you know, make sure that everything is valid, and then report that back. Um, and again, in like a couple of weeks of a hackathon, we were able to prove that this worked at a high level. 
There's still a lot of open questions to this though, and this is what we're working on right now. Um, the first really big and interesting one is the concept of history and syncing versus finality. So on the current Ethereum chain, uh, the proof of work one, we don't have a concept of finality. So every syncing mode that we use, um, every syncing mode that we use uh, kind of has some trade-offs around the historical data. But then once we move to the beacon chain, um, we have the concept of finality where, you know, past a certain point, things cannot reorg. Uh, so we need to figure out, like, how do we merge these two systems, which just make very different assumptions about historical data. The second big question is what the final architecture look like. You know, how do we want clients to communicate with each other? Do we want to allow many to many connections where you're, say, running, you know, multiple beacon chains with a single execution client? Um, and and basically, what are the, the, the design principles we want to adopt here? The third big thing is testing. So, you know, the merge is the most complicated change that we're ever going to have done on Ethereum. And it's bringing two completely separate systems together. So we need to make sure we have, you know, extensive testing architecture to support a pre-merge, uh, you know, testing testing the actual transition and trusting things after. So those are really the three big open questions, but there's also a ton more. So we've put together a merge checklist, which is in the Ethereum slash PM repository on GitHub. So that's Ethereum uh, forward slash PM. Um, and this basically lists all the things we still need to figure out. Uh, and for the things we are working on or currently figuring out, there's links to you know whether it's the PR, the EIP or whatnot. So this was a lot of information really quickly. Hopefully it gave you a good overview of the merge. Um, and Pooja from the Ethereum cat herders put together this great design that kind of shows exactly how this all, all works. Uh, so at the top, we have the Ethereum 1.0 uh, chain right now, or what we call the execution chain. You know, I said we went through the Berlin upgrade, then London. Uh, Shanghai is, uh, you know, a potential upgrade we might have before the merge, where if we decide to, you know, we need to push back the difficulty bomb. And then on the E2 side, um, you know, we have the consensus chain that's running today. They're going to have their first upgrade uh, called Altair. Um, and, you know, late this year, early next year, we will have the merge. And after that, we'll have only a single Ethereum chain uh, that's running the current EVM and the keeps the current states and accounts and smart contracts that we have today, but that is following the beacon chain for consensus rather than proof of work. So that's all I had. Thank you very much uh, for your time. And I hope this was helpful. If you have any questions or want to chat about this more, you can find me on Twitter. I'm at Tim Bako. Thank you.